ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum everybody, welcome home. It's good to see everybody here, alhamdulillah. Let me just get myself set up real quick. Uh, okay, uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, we've been able to, first of all, alhamdulillah, it's only 96 degrees today. I walked out this morning and I was like, it's chilly, it's kind of cold. <laughs> It's under 100? What's going on? Uh, no, alhamdulillah. Um, the, uh, um, the session last week, alhamdulillah, was, was a really special session with Sheikh Mikail. We were able to conclude our study of Surah Yusuf, uh, alhamdulillah. And, um, you know, when I, was, when I was sort of surveying and asking a few people uh, about what we should do next, you know, read something or go through a uh, different text, uh, one thing that was sort of unanimous was that uh, we wanted to do a couple more sessions or heartwork series is where we could do stories from the Quran. And so uh, we're going to do something really, inshallah, that I hope it's one of the ideas that was given to me. And I thought it was a great idea, mashallah, which is we're going to look at the life of one of the most incredible people in our historical faith tradition. Um, and we're going to look at his life. But the unique thing about his story is that it's not found in one place in the Quran. In fact, it's not unique. I guess it's different than Sayyidina Yusuf. Sayyidina Yusuf, his story is really only found. I mean, it's referenced, but it's really only found in one story, in one area, which is Surah Yusuf. But most prophets different than Yusuf, السلام, like Ibrahim, Musa, etc., they are, their stories are found in different areas, and they're kind of spread out over the different uh, chapters in the Quran. So... With Ibrahim alayhi salam, and that's who we're going to be talking about, inshallah, for the next few weeks. Ibrahim alayhi salam is referred to as Khalilullah. He is someone that's been given a unique title by Allah. Allah Ta'ala himself refers to him and says that he's his close friend. He's his Khalil. And so we wanted to go, inshallah, and go through each passage in the Quran where Ibrahim's story is told. Now, we don't have... Um, in the Qur'an itself, we don't have it from start to finish. Again, because why? The Qur'an is not a book of history. It's really important to remember this. A lot of people, when they talk about, well, why doesn't the Qur'an have every detail? Like, Allah knows everything. Why couldn't Allah have given us every single detail? I have questions. I want answers. Well, this isn't a history book. And if you look at books that are filled with details, they're not very inspiring, are they? Anyone here like really emotional about Encyclopedia Britannica? Does anyone here cry at Wikipedia? Like, no. You don't, you're not driven to anything by information, by raw information, okay? Now, you need raw information, so don't get me wrong. There's a place for history. There's a place for that. But the job of the Quran, the goal of the revelation of Quran is for guidance. And when you guide somebody you don't always want to include every detail because details can be distracting. You know, if I were trying to tell you where a restaurant was, right? If I, where's the nearest Pizza Hut? And I would say, okay, well, it's, it's, it's this far. Go down this road. You're going to see a dry cleaner next to it. Across the street is a Hobby Lobby. In front of the Hobby Lobby, there's 17 trees. I think they're oak. And then there's 14 parking spots. There might be a couple that are reserved for the Hobby Lobby for like expecting mothers. There's also a lot of, you know, uh, 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 food trucks in that area. Oh, by the way, did you know that there's also a place where you could check out your car for smog, get it tested, and there's a driver's license facility nearby, and there's also a, a McDonald's if you want ice cream. Imagine like if I just gave you all that information about what you, you just asked for Pizza Hut. By the end of it, you completely forgot what you asked, Right? Because the details were so overwhelming and there were too many of them, too much. Some of you are like, no, that was actually great. I needed that. The reality is that this is why the Quran was focused in its message. And Imam al-Ghazali says this. He says that the job of wahi, the job of revelation is to guide, is to guide somebody. So when we look at the story of Ibrahim, we're going to focus on what Allah gave us. Now, there's other texts historically, right? We have obviously the Isra'iliyat, which established the, uh, which is established from the Torah, from the Injil, right? So from the Old Testament, from the New Testament. And it's, it's entirely possible and plausible. And some scholars of Tafsir, they do this. They take some facts, some details, things like age, 
siblings, names, uh, length of time, years, numbers. They'll pull that from these books because these books tend to have more of those details. But we'll pull from those. But as the Prophet ﷺ said, لا نصدق ولا نكذب. We don't confirm these things. Like we're not we're not gonna name our children the reported name of the uncle of Ibrahim that we don't confirm, right? But at the same time, we're not going to say that it's made up. We take it as it is. And we rely on it in a way that is, that is sound enough for us to, to, to build on, but not for us to necessarily rely on for our faith. Okay? So the story of Ibrahim salam is one that is worth studying. Now, why do we study in these stories? Sheikh Mikhail, he mentioned it. Sheikh Mikhail specifically said it last week when he said that, why does Allah give us stories in the Quran? So that the Prophet was told by Allah that stories are the way in which Allah strengthens people's hearts. And Ibrahim is a very, very unique story. He, like Yusuf and like every Prophet, was tested with a lot of difficulty. A lot. I mean, how many of you have ever read the story or been taught the story of Ibrahim, if you've, been, if you've heard it or if you've seen it or been taught it at some level, you know that this guy was tested, subhanAllah, beyond belief. And this is the nature of prophethood. The Prophet, والسلام, he said that the most tested of people are the prophets, right? The most beloved of Allah are those who are tested the most. And the most tested are the prophets. And then he said, and then those who follow and then those who follow. Follow in time and also in piety. Exactly. Very good, mashallah. And so the reality is that when we look at these stories, you're going to see a lot of things that are going to be a little bit, uh, uh, wow, how, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put him in this, in this situation, in this position? It's natural for people to ask that question. If this person was chosen by Allah, why did he put him in such difficulty? Well, we're sitting here as the beneficiaries of those difficulties, those challenges. Because a lot of our lives are going to mirror some of these moments, just like it did with Prophet Yusuf So let's go a little bit through what Prophet Ibrahim his life and his story. Prophet Ibrahim was, was different than Sayyidina Yusuf in a, in a unique way. One of the things that was unique about Prophet, Prophet Ibrahim that was different than Prophet Yusuf was that Yusuf's father was who? What was his name? Yusuf's father? Yaqub, right? And Yaqub was what? A prophet. So Prophet Yaqub was Yusuf's father. How amazing is it? How awesome is it to know that your father is a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that what? That when he saw the dream, when Yusuf saw the dream where his brothers and his siblings and his parents were bowing towards him, who's the first person he went to? He went to his father. So he obviously had a really close relationship with his father. Now, in the previous session, when I started talking about being close to your father, I know that there are people in the room and I know for a fact that this is something that we struggle with, that they said, I, I can't relate. I have a really bad relationship with my father. Or I have a really difficult relationship with my parents. Right? And you don't have to nod. No one has to expose anything here. But that's the nature of it. So the Quran has stories that will hit for some people. And then for some aspects of those stories, it'll mean something different for others. So there were those people who had a relationship with their father like Yaqub and Yusuf and they were like, man, beautiful. And then there were those of us who when we heard those stories and we struggle sometimes, we have moments of tension, some difficulty with our parents. We hear that story and it starts to like turn in our heart a little bit. We wish that we had that. And you can't do anything in that moment except like yearn. So then that's why Allah Ta'ala gave us other stories. Ibrahim was born to a father who was not only not Muslim, not a prophet, but he was somebody that was a chief in regards to the pagan tradition. So he actually was somebody that was a leader in the, from among the mushrikun of the time. And he actually was somebody that would use his position, his leadership, and he would fashion idols, and he would take these you know raw materials like wood and stone and he would make these idols and he would either you know sell them or keep them and this is the job that he had now ibrahim was not somebody who 
like this from a very early age. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he gave Ibrahim this insight, this ability to see. And by the way, there's a lesson here, subhanAllah, is that sometimes even though somebody is young, they'll be able to see the truth much better than an older person. Not because they have more knowledge, but because sometimes the experiences you go through in life, they jade you and they cover up, they veil your ability to see things. Remember Sheikh Mikhail last week, he said what? He said, be more childlike. Be more like a child, not in your maturity, right? I don't want people to start pouting when we run out of matcha, having tantrums. No, but he said, be more like a child in the way that you're, you let your curiosity and your naive, not naivete, but you let your, your optimism and your hope and your curiosity with Allah, you let it take you to a better place. And so sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll meet with children, subhanAllah. I was talking to Musa yesterday in the car. Uh, was it yesterday? Two days ago. I was talking to Musa and Iman. So I was, I was taking them to the grocery store. Um, and I just, you know, try to ask these like questions that make them think. You know, not the boring ones like, what do you guys do today? You know, like all that. I said, what, guys, what's your favorite part about being Muslim? And M Musa goes, Allah. And I go, what about Allah? And he goes, that in Jannah, he's going to let me play with Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> and then I asked Nuni, Iman, uh, Iman, my daughter, Iman, I said, Nuni, what's your favorite part? And she said, Jannah. And I said, okay. And she goes, and the Kaaba. And then she said, can we go to, when we, well, she goes, when we go to Jannah, can we see the Kaaba? And I was like, yes, but we can also see it now. She was like, really? And I said, yeah, yeah. And then she was like shocked by that. So now I'm on the hook in the next year. I got to go to Umrah with my kids. <laughs> but there was just this wonder, right? And then I was like, what about being Muslim, you know, in this life? You guys are talking about the afterlife. What about? And they were like the masjid, right? They were like, we love going to Qalam. We love going to Roots. We love, you know, seeing people. Um, and this is, again, that, 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 that youthful heart. I mean, when's the last time any of us did this conversation with our friends what's your favorite part about being muslim you know you're like when i travel i can shorten my prayers i think <laughs> that's the best part <laughs> you know we we don't have that that excitement that passion that was in their voice we lost it so ibrahim is a young he's a young boy and he's able to see the truth much more clearly and much more distinctly than his father and so when he engages with his father from a young child, uh, you know, he basically has this, has this tension that he's noticing that his father is somebody that is doing things that don't make sense to him. Okay? Now, pause for a second, right? Like, there could very well be people that are in this room or listening online that have a very similar relationship with their own father that they don't understand why they behave this way. It's not a matter of preference, right? Preferences are different, okay? Like, you know, preferences are things like, do, do you put peanut butter and jelly on two separate slices of bread? Or do you put them on the same slice and then close the sandwich? That's preference, right? Preference is like, do you want your house to be 71 degrees or 73 degrees? That's preference. There's no like moral implication there. Like a moral question, a moral difference is like, do you ruin pizza with pineapple or not? That's like a moral, no, no, that's a preference. A moral, a moral difference is like, how do you view goodness? You know, there, there are some parents that really, really, when their kids get closer to Allah, the parents seem to get more upset. And so this is something that Ibrahim Ali said, now remember, I'm not trying to get you to project this if it's not there. I don't want you going home and being upset. Call your parents, be like, I knew I had more in common with Ibrahim Aisalam than any other prophet. Don't, don't, don't indict your parents on things that aren't actually there. What I want everyone to do is to hear this story and to think like, SubhanAllah, Allah knows me. Allah knew that I would need this. And so he sent it down as a, as a, as a, as a message. Okay? Now, what the irony behind Ibrahim salam having a challenging relationship with his father is that Ibrahim himself became the father of all the prophets. They call him Abul Anbiya. 
Ebul Anbiya, the father of the prophets, meaning that in his lineage, in his line of progeny from him all the way down to the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he is the head of that lineage. And so we learn that it doesn't matter where you start. Anybody can have a legacy that is incredible if Allah gives them that tawfiq. You know, some people that were born into like straight up kufr, absolute and clear rejection of Allah, became some of the most incredible luminaries in Islam. And some people that were born into like families of prophetic nobility, maybe they were even related to the Prophet or they were, they were born into families of knowledge. Those people became very, very distant from their tradition and sometimes even left their religion altogether. So where you start is irrelevant. Where Allah places you in terms of your beginning is irrelevant as far as it does not dictate your level of success. But it does give you the ability to take your context and to turn something that is difficult into something great, right? The lemons into lemonade. And so Ibrahim salam was in the process or in the, um, I should say, in the environment of seeing the process of idol worship. And he was somebody that had trouble with this from a young age. Now we're going to begin our first story, which is Ibrahim salam's recognition of Allah. His recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But before we begin that, let's go through a couple points about why we study Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay? Number one is that Allah ta'ala said that he is somebody who is to be replicated. He, he described him as saying that he was always on the right path. Millata Ibrahim Hanifa. That he was always on the path of you know, Hanif means always on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's actual belief, the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from day one. You know, because Islam, as we practice it today, is not a new religion. Islam is actually simply the revival and the restoration of God's original religion. We believe that we're practicing what Allah wanted everyone to believe from day one. Now, along the way, there were some deviations, right? Along the way, whether it was politics or whether it was any sort of social pressure, people who practiced religions went away from their prophets. And they pushed away from revelation. And they decided to change some things, convenience-wise or politically. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of stories that show us that. But we believe that what we are practicing today as Muslims is simply and is absolutely, without a doubt, exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down through Adam salam and through all the prophets all the way until the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So as Imam Shiraj Wahaj said, when I was really young, I was attending a lecture, he goes, Islam is not a new religion. Islam is the oldest religion. Muslims should not feel like they are novel or new or weird. No, you're actually the one who is following exactly what Allah Ta'ala designed you to follow. And so Ibrahim is a, is a prophet that brought people back to the original way of life. The way of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala also chose him to be his close friend. Right? Allah ta'ala in the Quran, he says that. He took Ibrahim as a close friend. And so this is something that again, what are the traits of this person that made him have this position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He's obviously very, very special. Allah ta'ala calling him his close friend. I was having a debate with somebody, by the way, a few days ago. How many of you believe that you can only have one single best friend. Anyone here believe that you can have multiple best friends? Do you guys have friends? <laughs> no one raised their hands. Okay. Right? So this is a debate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described Ibrahim as one of his best friends, as his close friend, alayhi salam. When you know that about somebody, you inevitably have to be asking like, what made them that special? What made him so unique? And we're going to talk about that during this series, inshallah. Allah Ta'ala also made him one of the greatest religious figures across religions. Ibrahim. If you say Abraham, there's a connotation of respect. There's a connotation of reverence across religious groups because of Ibrahim alayhi salam. 
Ibrahim and his son raised the foundations and constructed the original stature, the original foundations of the Kaaba. So the Kaaba that we go to, that we pray towards every day, that we go and visit on Umrah and Hajj, Ibrahim and his son were given the blessing of raising the foundations of that house. Ibrahim was ultimately, Prophet Ibrahim salam was ultimately the reason his prayer for the arrival of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So there's many things that make him special and unique. But let's begin by learning his story and pulling some lessons from it. So this is Surah Al-An'am, the first section that we're going to go through. It's the chapter number 6, verses 74, and I think it goes to like 83. Maybe 84. 83, yeah. So in Surah Al-An'am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala memorializes and documents a very tough conversation. How many of you have had a tough conversation with your parents before? Yeah, right? I want to marry her, Baba. And she's not from our village. <laughs> okay, tough conversations. I got married, alhamdulillah, 15 years ago. I can make jokes. Okay, I, tough conversations. They're not easy. And guess what? Can I tell you something? I'm 35. My parents, alhamdulillah, you know, they're older. The tough conversations never go away. They never go away. You're always going to have them. Okay. It's part of the tax that you got to pay on being raised and being alive today by your parents' efforts, okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives us a dialogue between Ibrahim and his father, Azar. He says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ لِأَبِيهِ أَزَرَ أَتَّتَّخِذُ أَسْنَامًا إِلَاهَةً He says that, Ibrahim said to his father, and again, this is that, that inquisitive mind, but that faithfully grounded mind. He said to his dad, are you seriously taking these asnam? Asnam literally means something that you make with your own hands. So he says, dad, are you worshiping something that you created? You created this thing. Are you going to worship that thing? Then he says, inni araka wa qawmaka fi dhalal mubin. He says, Dad, I can't, like, I, my mind cannot square this. I can't wrap my head around this. You and your people are clearly incorrect. You can't, you can't justify this, right? Now, when you read the story and you start and you hear that Ibrahim is so forward, first of all, there's a couple things. Number one is that Ibrahim, alayhi salam, has spent a lot of time up until this point like discussing with his dad, having conversations with his father, with Azar. Okay? So he's not just coming in hot. He's not, you know, sometimes like when you think about how to have a tough conversation, a good advice that I've received is that you have to make sure that you pick the right time and the right place and you have to make sure that you lead up to it, right? You can't come in and drop the heaviest you know, piece of info that you have and you're shaking and rattling this person's world, and they've had a tough day, right? you got to plan things properly. This is from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. There's a right time and a right place and a right way to have tough conversations. But, okay, that's the general rule. Here's the concession. The concession is that after you've had that conversation, after you've done everything you've needed to do, you set it up properly, you did everything properly, and you have not seen any progress, and things are not changing, and things are the way they are, then, only then, are you allowed to, as a person, then have that tough conversation in a little bit more of a direct way. Okay, so we know that Ibrahim, from childhood, was somebody that talked to his father and engaged with his dad and spoke to him and said, are you, is this real? Is this real? He even one time, there's a narration that says that Ibrahim one time saw his father make an idol that had particularly large ears. Like imagine like an elephant, basically. And exactly, just like he's laughing up here. Ibrahim actually asked his father, he said, why does that one have big ears? And his dad said, well, he has big ears. And the narration says that his dad basically had to like come up with something. So he said that he has big ears because he's, he's full of wisdom. And Ibrahim's response, just like, my, my man up here is, Ibrahim just started laughing. Like, you know how children laugh? 
They just kind of like, they can't control it. They think something's funny, they start laughing. Now imagine that he's laughing at, I mean, to his dad, at God, or one of God's, right? He's laughing. And so Ibrahim has grown up in this environment, and he's tried to have these conversations. Granted, I wouldn't recommend laughing at somebody if you're trying to understand, especially as an adult, you can't excuse it. If a kid's a kid, it is what it is. But Allah Ta'ala actually says, لا تصب الذين يدعون من دون الله Allah actually tells adults, like mature people, don't curse those who they call upon other than Allah. Do not. So Muslims are not allowed to go and say, your gods are so dumb and worthless. We're not allowed to. Why? Because Allah says, then they will come back and they will curse Allah بغير ilm without knowledge. So Allah says, never be the reason why people come and curse Allah. Even if, even if you believe in your heart that this makes no sense, don't go to somebody who holds something in high esteem, religiously devoted to it. Don't go and say, you're foolish, you're stupid, you're an idiot. Don't do that. Right? Because disrespect is not going to, it's not going to reciprocate respect. Okay? But Ibrahim now is speaking to his father and he's getting a little bit more direct. But this is before he's a prophet. So he says, father, are you seriously... You want me to believe that you take this idol that you made as a god. Surely you got to see that you and your people, there's something off about this. There's something wrong about this. Okay? And Allah Ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُورِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مَلَكُوتَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلْيَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُقِينِينَ That at that moment when he said that statement, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him something very profound. It's hard to translate. Malakut. Malakut as samawati wal ard. It means the dominion or the kingdoms. But this is not talking about palaces. It's not talking about like, you know, the, the places that we see on this earth. No. This is the malakut refers to the unseen divine wonders. Let me, let me help you translate this. Okay. Ibrahim just did what? He had a very hard conversation. And he said something that was absolutely and, and, and totally true with regards to the belief of idols. He said, what? This is clearly wrong. Dalal mubin. That's a tough thing to say, isn't it? Have you guys ever had to like stand up for your beliefs in a time that was very difficult? Have you ever had to like say something that was very challenging? Have you ever had to pray in public? <laughs> Have you ever had to turn away food that was offered to you because it was cooked in something that was haram? Have you ever had to have an uncomfortable moment where you had to represent your principle? Yes or no? What happens leading up to that moment? How do you feel? How do you feel when you have to represent your belief principally, but you know that it's going to be difficult? How do you feel leading up to the moment? Hmm? Who feels nervous? Yeah, Nabil. How do you feel? Vulnerable? Okay, why? What are you thinking in that moment? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. So let's say you're, you're hanging out with somebody and they want to go eat somewhere and you're like, I, can't, I don't want to be that person that's challenging you and your beliefs. And subhanAllah, that actually comes up in this passage. So you feel vulnerable in that moment. You have like a feeling of weakness. Like, do I choose my social relationship, my friend or my family, or do I choose what I know to be correct? Right? Anyone else? How do you feel when you're leading up to the moment of having a really difficult conversation regarding your belief? Taking Jummah off on Fridays. Anyone had to have that struggle? Y'all pray Jummah or no? No one's had that struggle before? Yeah. Okay. Like what's an example of a second thought you might have in a hypothetical? Okay. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay. So he says if if it's too if it's going to be too difficult having this conversation you know, maybe it's just better if I pray Dhuhr instead of Jummah. Maybe I just do that instead. And then you know what? I'm sure like Allah will understand. Because doesn't Allah want successful like professionals? 
isn't that part of like our thing is like be successful in life and like I give zakat so like yeah because the nafs is a great lawyer like you can always figure it out right and we want to run away from discomfort the the soul does not want to be in an uncomfortable position and so you're like at that moment where you know you have to say what you have to say but you don't want to say it so you either have to negotiate like a social thing or a professional thing okay you have those moments. Now, let me ask you something. How many of you have ever had that conversation and you were scared out of your mind, like walking up to it, okay? And then after it went okay or it went well, how did your heart feel in that moment? Really good. Relieved, right? You walked out, you're like, oh, my goodness. And then you even started like second-guessing yourself. Why, why, why did I worry? Why was I concerned? That's a miniature version of what Ibrahim A.S. experienced. A miniature version. Before you made the statement, before you made the statement, what happened? When you were scared, you lacked trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that moment. What if they fire me? What if, what if they say no? I want to get married so bad. What if they say no? Because I don't want to do this. Because I don't want to uh, have a wedding like this or do that. What if they take away this position? What if my friends don't want to hang out with me anymore? Right? What if they don't want to do this? What if I don't want to see Barbie? <laughs> Will they be friends with me still? And there's that nervousness. There's that nervousness leading up to it. That nervousness is set in a state of doubt about your relationship with Allah. That's why Allah Ta'ala, when he describes Ibrahim, and he says when he makes that jump against his gut, you know what I mean? Like you, you have every reason not to do the right thing. Your mind has already laid out the entire plan. If I do this, I'm going to be alone forever. If I do this, I'm not going to have any. If I do this, I'm going to fail. I'm going to be fired. I'm never going to be competitive in this job market if I stick to my principles. But then you go into heart work or something, or you go to Sheikh Mikhail's halakha, and Sheikh Mikhail pulls one of those, I don't know if this means anything to somebody, but do the right thing. He just says it. And you're like, is this man talking to me? And he's like, if you're wondering if I'm talking to you, yes. <laughs> you know? It's like one of those TikToks that you scroll on. I don't know who needs to hear this, but... It's like, I don't know who needs to hear this, but just do what would please Allah in that moment. You know why? Because if you please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah ta'ala will never abandon you. If, you. if you focus on pleasing Allah, you will gain closeness to Him, and Allah does not let those who are close to Him fail. He does not. Allah is like, the, is like the life raft in the ocean. You can't drown if you're close. And so Ibrahim in that moment, he says what? He, he, he toughens up and he says to his father, he says, This is wrong. I have to say it. This is incorrect. And Allah Ta'ala tells us, At that moment, he was given this access. And Malakut al-Samawat, the Mufassirin, they say that it, Ibrahim was able to see now Allah in everything that he did. He was able to see that instead of him just saying this for his own, now this is for Allah. Instead of him seeing the sun rise as, wow, that's beautiful. He was able to say, subhanAllah. Instead of him just eating food and saying, this is delicious, he said, alhamdulillah. Everything now revolved around his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that moment. So what's lesson number one from the life of Ibrahim? How do you become a friend of Allah? You do tough things. And when you do tough things, Allah makes life a little bit easier for you. He doesn't make life easier, sorry. He gives you a skill that makes you able to handle it. Ibrahim's life does not get easier, by no means. In fact, it only gets harder. But by giving him the malakut, by giving him this ability to see what is previously hidden from most people, which is their purpose and their relationship with Allah. Now, all of a sudden, these moments become easier for him. Allah Ta'ala gave him certainty. Wouldn't you guys do the right thing always if you certainly knew that it would never mess you up? Why do we choose to do the wrong thing? Because sometimes we trust our own desires more than Allah. I'm going to do this. I'm going to lie on my resume. Why? Because... I don't think that du'a will get me the job. I think I need to put that experience on there and list Muhammad Muhammad as my supervisor. 
worked at this company for eight years. Sir, you're 23. You've been working there since 15. You were a business analyst at 15. Yeah, call Muhammad Muhammad. <laughs> Sir, your name is Ahmed Muhammad. Are you related? No, that's racist. <laughs> we believe that making dua is not going to open that door for me. So I got to take care of it myself. <laughs> right? But the moment that your life is given access to Allah, you realize that, you know what? Making dua will open doors that I could have never opened myself. And that's what Ibrahim salam experienced. Now, Ibrahim did something very interesting in this moment. He decided to go to all of the different things that his people worshipped. And he decided to, I don't want to say give it a chance because he's a prophet. He didn't give it a chance, right? But he wanted to go do his due diligence. You know, like, you know when people really want you to try something and you know it's not going to be good? Like, you already know that your favorite boba place is gongcha. And they're like, no, you got to try this new place. And you know it's not going to be good. It's like Bubble Tea Express. And you're like, oh, God. Or it's like pizza. It's like, no, no, no. You don't know. Domino's new crust is amazing. And you're like, that's okay. But you do it. You go along with it. Why? Because in fiqh, they call it idmam al hujja You need to establish the proof. So Ibrahim is like, okay, whatever you worship, I'm, let's go check it out. <laughs> Let's, I don't worship it, right? He clearly made his argument. I don't worship it, but let's go check it out. So then this group of people that he just said, like, you guys are incorrect. You worship stone. You worship wood. You worship the stars. You worship the, the moon. You worship the sun. So the sun sets, the night takes over, and appears in front of them a star, a bright star. The tafsir says like a super, super bright star. And he says, Hada Rabbi. Okay, so you guys would say, this is my Lord. All right, so he looks at the star, it's bright, it's shining super bright in the sky. Hada Rabbi. Then Allah Ta'ala says, أَفَلَ قَالَ لَا أُحِبُّ الْآفِلِينَ But then when the night perished and the, and the light started to come, the dawn started to appear. And you know, there's a period where like the night is dark, dark, dark. And then right before dawn, you'll start to see the gradient. Well, it goes from like pitch dark, like purplish black to start becoming a little bit lighter and lighter and lighter. And then the orange hues start to pick in. And what you notice is the first thing that disappears after the darkness is the stars. So it still feels like night, but the stars become less apparent. So when this starts to happen and that bright star starts to dim, 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 and then eventually becomes invisible. Ibrahim a.s. he says, فَلَمَّا أَفَلَا He says, قَالَ لَا أُحِبُّ الْآفِلِينَ He says, wait a minute. I don't love things that go away. I don't, I don't love, meaning in terms of loving a God, I don't devote myself to God lovingly to things that disappear. My God doesn't disappear. And this is very interesting. What, is, what do people use stars for? Interesting. The Arabs in particular, right, the people, Ibrahim is from Iraq. He's from Iraq. So he's with his people. And in this part of the world at this time, stars are used for navigation, especially bright stars, especially bright ones, because they're able to pin, right, their location. I know that this is going to become increasingly less relevant because we can't drive anywhere without Google Maps. Imagine that this star is Google Maps. That's what they used it for. So in order for them to figure out where they were going, where they needed to go, what direction they needed to take, they would simply look up. Now, here's the interesting thing, is that they would only be able to see where they were when? At night. Very good. They wouldn't be able to do the, the geo-navigation during the day because that reference point was missing. And so what would happen is every night they would check their directions. And they would recalibrate and then they would move. And then they would recalibrate and they would move. So if you look at like the, 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 the travel path of people who traveled back in the time of using stars only, you would see there was like a mini zigzag that was happening. Because they would never go in a directly straight line because there was always some degree of what? Of deviation. Now here's the thing. Ibrahim a.s. is trying to teach them about God. And what do we know about Allah. 
Is Allah, what do you know about Allah? There is no God but Allah. Beautiful. La ilaha illallah. Does God ever go away? No. no. He said no. He looked at me. He's like, no. He's forever. I love it, mashallah. He's the creator of us, animals, and game developers. He's the creator of authors of books. Absolutely beautiful. What's your name, Habib? What's your name? Abbas. I love it, mashallah. Abbas just gave everyone a lesson in Tawheed. And Ibrahim, السلام, see again, if you say this to somebody, Allah is the creator of everything. They'd be like, prove it. Right? Ibrahim السلام, took a little bit of a different route. Even though he had certainty in Allah, what did he say? He said, okay, let's entertain your idea, your proposition. Let's go worship the stars. But then all of a sudden when dust comes, you're like, wait, what are you worshiping? Your God is gone. Your God's not present. I can't see where your God, how do I know that they're there? Right? The stars disappear. So Ibrahim says, I'm not, I'm not down to worship something that disappears. And he's giving his people a lesson, which is what? My Lord, Allah, is always there. Allahu la ilaha illahu al-hayyul qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatan wa la nawm. Allah Ta'ala is the one who is alive and ever-present. He is never taken by tiredness or sleep or exhaustion. Part of what gives us such amazing conviction in Allah is knowing that whether we are here or there, Allah is there. Whether it's now or later or before Allah was there, Allah is here and Allah will be there. Imagine this message that he's giving to his people. And with regards to the star in particular, what's the message he's giving? How can you navigate your life? Not, not travel. How can you navigate your heart on a God that is only present in your life for one or two hours a day? Whereas for us as Muslims, we say what? Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. My prayer and my worship and my life and my death are all for Allah. Allah is ever present in my life ever present in my life. You see that certainty just come out? Okay, the next one. He continues. And now they see the moon. So he's taking this group of people, right? Okay. He sees the moon. It's just starting to rise into the sky, into the sky at the beginning of the night. This is my Lord. Okay. I'm good. This is God. As soon as it starts to disappear, he says, what? He says that if my Lord does not guide me, then I certainly will become one of these misguided people. He's commenting on this like, subhanAllah, these people are falling into this. Now, the, the moon at night gave light. Light is something that shows us everything. If something is pitch black, if you're inside, actually this happened to me a, a week ago. Uh, I was watching a, 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 a TikTok video that said that when there's some superstitious stuff happening in your house, wink, wink, you know what I mean? I know there's kids here, so I'm going to be very vague. When there's other entities in your house, it messes with your power. And I watched that video and I was like, oh God. And so I just turned it off. And then I went to my kitchen sink and I started doing the dishes and I was getting ready to like just dive into bed. You know when you're so tired, you're like kind of like that Donald Duck animation where you just dive into your bed. I was washing my dishes and I was almost done. My wife and, and my kids were hanging out with their grandparents. They were spending the night. So it was just me. I was going to sleep, have a good night. And I had the last pot and I'm washing it and boo, everything goes dark. And mind you, this is right after the TikTok video that I watched. So I become the loudest Quran reciter <laughs> in the history of Dallas, Texas. And I, my house is pitch black. Like everything is super dark. I look at my phone, there's like, of course, what? 6% left. It's like 114 degrees outside because it's night in Dallas in the summer. So I text my neighbor, Jason. Allah Yahdi, my love him guy. He's an amazing guy, man. Jason, I told you guys about Jason, right? The baklava fiend. So I text my neighbor, Jason, 
And I'm like, power go out? He goes, yeah. So I come outside. He's got flashlights, whatever. And then we turn off all the flashlights because my phone is at 6% and I have no power. This is how addicted to our phones we are. I was, I was genuinely considering manually opening my garage and starting my car outside so I could charge my phone. Mind you, I was going to go to sleep. But to be real, there's no way I was going to go to sleep in that house until the lights came back on. <laughs> Just because of that one TikTok video. Okay, so I'm sitting outside and I'll tell you something. I realized that inside my house was darker than outside. When I was inside, I couldn't see anything. It was so hard to walk. It was so hard to navigate. I think I stepped on a cat. When I got outside, I don't even have a cat. No, I'm joking. <laughs> when, when, I, when I stepped outside, the moon, subhanAllah, was so bright. It was so bright that once my eyes adjusted, and if you spend time in nature, you can appreciate this. Once your eyes adjust, you can see things as clearly as the day. Side note. This is why when the companions said that I looked at the face of the Prophet وسلم, and I looked at the full moon and I looked back at his face وسلم, and I looked at the moon, I couldn't decide which was more beautiful. <laughs> like because when you realize the, 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 the magnitude of a full moon and how bright it is and how absolutely beautiful it is and then you look at the face of the most beautiful creation most beautiful human being, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That companion's like, I couldn't, I couldn't tell what was brighter, what was more stunning, and obviously by that he meant the Prophet sallallahu was more beautiful. So I went out and I saw this moon, and it, it, you know, as I was reading this verse, I was thinking to myself, man, the moon is such a a a function for people. It gives them light. I was literally unable to see, and now I can see, right? And then. It disappears, and Ibrahim salam says, the one who lets me see doesn't disappear. So first it was the star. The one who gives me guidance doesn't go away. Now it's the moon. And when the moon went away, he says, the one who lets me see when, when, when it's as dark as can be, and I need help, and the one who gives me guidance, and the one who gives me light in those moments, he never leaves. He never leaves. فَلَمَّا رَأَى الشَّمْسَ بَازِغَةً قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي Last one. They go and the sun starts to come and when it reaches that point, right, الضُحَى when it reaches that point in the sky, هَذَا رَبِّي He says, this is our Lord, this is my Lord. هَذَا أَكْبَر Like the star was okay, it was, it was bright. The moon was brighter. Nothing's brighter than this. Look at the power. Look at the power of this thing. No one can deny how powerful the sun is, subhanAllah. So powerful that, you know, look at the distance we are away from it, yet it still provides so much heat. Even your cold water tap is hot, right? You in Texas, you turn on cold water, it's still warm, subhanAllah. Okay? هذا أكبر فلما, he says, أثلت قالا. He says, when this sun started to set at Maghrib time and eventually it disappeared, he said what? Ya qawmi, inni bari'un mimma tushrikun. He said, this is the conclusion of my experiment. We're done now. I am free from anything else that you choose to worship besides Allah. He says, I've tried to do this with you. I've walked every step. We did the sun, we did the stars, we did the moon. We did everything, right? The stars, the moon, and the sun. And I, and I gave it my best. I, you know, I was trying to be there with you. But every time it disappeared... I came to the realization that this could not be the thing that I would worship. This thing did not create me. This thing did not give me my life. And so Ibrahim salam did that experiment with them. Then he says, what? Inni wajahtu wajhiya lillahi samawati wal ard hanifan. He says, I have decided, I have proclaimed that I'm going to submit. I'm going to turn my face, meaning I'm going to submit my everything. To who? To the one who has created the things that you worship. Everything that you worship is actually under the creation category of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created everything. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And I will never ever fall into being a person that confuses the creation for the creator. This is the lesson from night number one. Ibrahim salam became a friend of Allah because he never let himself become confused between creator and creation. How many times do we think that money will help us? 
How many times do we think that power will help us? Status will help us. My network will help me. Everything will help me. The khutbah on Friday was beautiful. Hafid Naim gave the khutbah. And he said that we oftentimes confuse the way that Allah helps us as God itself. We say that the asbab are musabibul asbab. That the means are in fact the, the actual God themselves. But he says, no. Every means you have in your life, if you're a Muslim, like Ibrahim a.s., you want to become a friend of Allah, every means you have in your life, never forget that the one who created that is the one who facilitated that means for you in your life. And never confuse the two. One of the great Mufassirin, uh, Ibn Ajiba, he said something really beautiful. He said, one way you can test this out is he says that when you feel a sense of sakina, when you feel a sense of relief in your heart from something, right? Every two weeks when you get paid, when the weekend hits, you guys know that Friday afternoon feeling? For some of us, it's like Thursday night is like an early weekend because Friday you're going to work from home. You know when that relief starts to hit you? He said that. The believer is somebody that whenever they feel a sense of relief, they attribute it to Allah. That Allah gave me this thing that's giving me relief. He says whether it's money or whether it's anything else that they're obsessed with. And he realizes, the believer, that it is Allah who created this thing. So I don't need to worship it. I'm not going to worship money. I'm not going to worship power or status or my degree. I'm not going to worship these things. I'm not going to devote myself to this stuff. Many of you are like, how do we worship it? When I skip prayers for work, who am I worshiping? If I skip prayer because I want to make money, what am I worshiping? If I sacrifice my Islamic principles to do something that I know is not right, what am I doing? What am I doing? And Allah will be so proud of you and incredibly I mean, Allah is so gracious. He will reward you for even the smallest thing. I told you about my friends. No, I didn't. My friends who went and saw Oppenheimer. And they picked the... Okay, forget the movie itself. They picked a movie. There were two movie times. Okay? Can I tell you a story about loving Allah featuring Oppenheimer? No, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'll tell you a story about loving Allah featuring a movie. Because you can love Allah anywhere. And you can be like Ibrahim anywhere. Picking movie times. What's the first question that these guys asked? When's Maghrib? That's going to dictate when we're going to see the movie. That's, that's the believer. Like anyone else is like, when does Maghrib end? How far is the theater? Can we combine? Am I traveling technically, right? Right? Then you have the one guy who's muhaddith. He's like, you know, the Prophet said, be in this life as a traveler, so kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib aw abr as Like, we can just combine all the time, right? Thank you. Never do fiqh, please, sir, right? <laughs> just have your spiritual reflections and just stop there. The first question that was asked, what time is Maghrib? We're not going to go see this movie if it comes into class. Okay, now here's the thing. Maghrib is 821. And then at the time, it was like 830. Guess what time the movie started? Guys, come on. 8.30, thank you, right? Everyone's waiting. This is not a pop quiz. You're not going to get it wrong. The movie's 8.30. Maghrib's 8.30, right? Or, I'm sorry, the movie's 8.15. Maghrib's 8.30. Everyone's like, oh, 15 minutes for trailers, whatever. There was unanimous consensus amongst this group of guys that, you know what? We're, just, we're not even going to care about the first part of the movie. We're just going to pray Maghrib on time. They did their jama'ah in, in the lobby of the theater, butter all over the floor, as is, they prayed right there, like nine or ten of them deep, okay? They also went, now listen to this, there's a website called Kids in Mind. It details all of the haram scenes that are potentially in movies, they, and it tells you where they are. They went and they researched these scenes from a website that's meant for children, and they said, we're not going to subject our eyes to this stuff. Now, don't get me wrong. Is it better to just not go? Absolutely. Absolutely. But here's why I'm telling you this story. Because there are people that love Allah even in their weakness. Does that make sense? Like, there are people that are like, look, I'm going to go see it, okay? I'm not strong. I'm going to go see it. 
at least let me not bring the wrath of Allah upon my eyes in that theater. I'm going to have taqwa in that moment. And one of the guys told me that they looked away from the haram scenes, so much so that a non-Muslim person sitting next to them was like, you guys can look now. <laughs> That's what it's like to love Allah in your weakness. To love Allah at every moment. They didn't walk into a dark theater and say, okay, Allah can't see me here. Remember the story of the children, right? When you were a kid, your parents always told you that story about the kid. Here's a piece of candy. Go eat it where Allah can't see you. Subhanallah. Ibrahim a.s. teaches us that Allah will be with you wherever you are. So don't forget him wherever you are. Allah sees you exactly, Abbas. Abbas knows it, mashallah. Let me share with you one line of poetry and then we break, inshallah, for Maghrib. Oh, and then he says, sorry, and then the Mufassir said that, if a person is not able to decide who they love more, if a person is not able to decide who they love more, Allah or their dunya beloved, their created beloved, he says they'll never feel sakina. They won't be given sukun, subhanAllah. Allah protect us, man. And he says, He says, Kana hijab and bainahu wa baina shuhud asrada tawheed. And their love for that thing will always serve as a barrier. It will always be an obstacle, an obstruction between them and their true realization of who Allah is. The poet said, Well, Ibn Ata'illah he says, Ma ahbabta shay'an illa wa kunta abdan lahu. It's not possible that you love something except that you become a slave to it. If you love something, you become a slave. People stay up late for all kinds of things because you have servitude. Wahua Allah la yuhibbu an takuna li abdan. And Allah does not like that you subject yourself to servitude in a lowly way to anything beyond Him. Because servitude to Allah raises you, servitude to everything else lowers you. We ask Allah Ta'ala to protect us. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us the lesson of his beloved friend Ibrahim Aisalam, that we're able to be convicted believers in a moment that tests us the most, and that we're able to be able to get, we're, we're given the witness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in every moment of life that we can make decisions that lead us to Allah even in our weakest moments. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Rahimin. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, I just noticed at the end we have Sheikh Muhammad Mendez here with us. I want to ask his forgiveness for continuing to teach in front of him as he is a, a, a much, much, uh, uh, mashallah, a great scholar. I have no uh, right to sit in the microphone in front of him, mashallah. May Allah ta'ala accept our gathering because we have righteous people here, alhamdulillah. Um, we won't be doing any questions right now because Maghrib is going to be happening. So I would like for everyone, inshallah, to make their way to the masjid, uh, inshallah, and then we'll see each other next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.